So what did Croke Park look like 70 years ago? Here's a description by the longtime Dublin official Mick Leahy, who was in the ground on the 21st of November 1920, a tragic day that's etched in the story not only of Croke Park, but also in the history of the nation. I remember well getting ready to go to Croke Park. We had been up in the park and we went to myself and my brother. My father was working that time. That day he, he was what they call... Um, he was a driver in the trams that time, you know, and he used to have to work on the Sunday, so he wasn't off that day. But uh, on the way down, we used to walk down, down the North Circle Road, on the way down at the Doyle's Corner, my father was just getting off morning duty, and he saw us going down, and he was going to stop us going down, but the, the conductor who was with him, he was another GA man, and he was from where Dan Fraher comes from, Dungarvan County, Waterford, and he said, I'll let them go down, and that there'll be no trouble on it. They were after hearing about the trouble in the city that morning, you know. So off we went, and we went down, and as usual, we went into Crow Park. Used, that time you used to go in the canal end, and just as you go in, you'd be confronted by a big bank, you know. Just a big bank, like there was no stands or terrace in there, and uh, made our way round to the hill. That bank we used to go round to the where you now where the the vision is now where you come up when you're going into the Cusick stand mm -hmm. and then start at the hill. That bank was just clay, like a clay bank and then the hill was it was rubble, it was clinkers and that, you know. But we went to our usual spot, which was the railway wall behind the railway goal. So you could you could come in at one end and walk right around right, to the opposite end. Right around, you know. But if you were going in, you could come on to in the hill. There were gates around there. But that was the nearest gate to us. We went right. in there. So the trouble now you're talking about uh, that you'd heard about earlier in the morning, that was uh, uh, the killing of uh, several correct. members of the British forces. Correct. That was correct. That was... Uh, uh, and the big match was a challenge game between Dublin and, Tip between Dublin and Tipperary. Tipperary. Yes. And there was lots in the paper beforehand about it, you know. So... Uh, we were there just as usual, and then the match started, and the match was on about 10 minutes when we heard these bangs. But at that time, you think they were slap bangs, you know, we didn't know what it was until after a while we noticed everyone running towards the gates and shouting and screaming. These bangs kept going on. Yeah. But uh, when we got down at that time, over where the new uh, stand is now, you see, the... There was no wall around Crow Park. It was a galvanised hoarding of about, we'd say about eight feet high or seven to eight feet high in that. And we rushed down the hill. You had to slide down the hill, down the back. You know, there was no steps no step. or anything. We slide down and everyone, but everyone was trying to get to the gates out and they were full. And but we got to this galvanised and some men there lifted us up and pushed us on the top. We had to jump down over. And about how many people would you say were at the match that day? I mean, since it was a challenge, it couldn't have been a huge crowd. No, no, I think there was something, something about 8,000, I think, were oh, there. And the red yeah. And do you remember seeing any of the players falling yeah. on the ground or Michael Hogan? No, you no. You don't remember that? I'll tell you why. You, when they all the screeching all started, we were, we were shouted at to get out as quick as possible, you know, as quickly as possible. And that. But when we got out over and onto the ground, myself and my brother, the first house, I think it's where the uh, caretaker now, the handball alley lives. The doors were open and the people were all being pushed in there, like uh, called in there, if you like, you know. So we went into that room and it was chock full into that house, chock full. There were women and men and there was one player. One player was there and in his togs and that, who which, afterwards which turned out... From? When Sean, Sean seen it, Sean seen it. Yeah, yeah. One of the famous things. So we were all there and chucking and that, and uh, the rosary, somebody started saying the rosary. Heard that there was someone killed or shot and that, and we started saying the rosary. And uh, it wasn't long until there were two big bangs on the door, and in came two soldiers. One, I think, was an auxiliary, and the other was a soldier, and that, and uh, like they were talking to the woman of the house and that and she was explaining I suppose it was everything but uh, they went out anyway and <coughs> the road the prayers continued and they came back after a few minutes and they said that the, they take out John Cena at first he went out first and uh, they handed him over to somebody and they came back again immediately and said the women and children so we were next out 
Well, uh, had you any idea at the time where the shots came from? I believe they came from from, from the railway. Even after they came from the hill, because you could see, you can see, oh, you see, the uh, the hill that I said when you when you come into the ground wasn't as big as a terrace is now, you know, yeah. and it even wasn't as big as the wall where the people sit on, you know, wasn't as tall as that, and uh, you could see right into the pitch from the canal bridge. Like, you know, coming down, there were no posts, there was no hoardings or anything. You could see right into the pitch. And in fact, the house I'm talking about, you could see that, Probably like, good. over to. And as you notice today in, in Crow Park, Mick, you can see that house if you're in the mm-hmm. AC box. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when, uh, uh, we went up, and when we went to the top of uh, James's Avenue, we were searched. Yeah. And we were told that... Uh, we could go. Well, my brother, it was like going to confession. There were two rows, two soldiers searching, you know. He was on the left, I was on the right. Well, he took the left. He came home by the North Circle Road, and I went by Ballybock, and he got home first and said I was lost, and of course, my people were anxious to know. But mind you, a few years afterwards, I was anxious to know about John Sinnott. What happened to him? He was taken out first. And John told me, he was at a dinner on Rose had, and he was sitting beside me, and we spoke about it, and that it was a coincidence, you know. And uh, John told me that he was walked down Clonliffe Road, along Ballybock Road, and when he got around Ballybock, there's the Red Bridge there, in the Red Bridge there, and uh, he he was just at that Red Bridge when, and Clonliffe Avenue is on the right, some soldier whistled the soldier that was with him, and the soldier told him to run. The soldier, uh, John said afterwards that he thought that the soldier who whistled had come across something. Yeah. You know, so he told John to go, run. Before John came out of the house, some lady gave him a coat to put over him, you know. So he hadn't got it when he was going away. But he ran anyway, and he was expecting a bullet every minute in the back. But no, he got around the corner and got home to 62 North Sheriff's Street where he lived. The first, the first thing that struck us, we, those of us who had volunteer training, was to lay prone on the ground and fall on that uh, a voice, a consolation voice, shouted out, the firing blanks. A minute later, it was obvious they weren't firing blanks. Sparks started to fly out of the railway wall and uh, people started to roll down from the embankments and it was obvious that people were getting shot. We were laying prone, we lay still prone, and the backs, our backs and the flowers, the Dublin flowers, rushed away, fr- rushed away from the fire end, from the canal end of it, and they rushed towards the railway exit. That is how the backs were ahead of us who were in the centre field. Then, they, as the fire continued, they decided, our, both the Dublin and the Parade teams decided to leave in pairs, left automatically in pairs. T- two pairs left. Hogan was in the top pair that got up to go, and as he did, he fell forward. I was within about three yards of him at the time, lay in the centre field, when, as he fell forward and fell to the ground, I saw the blood gushing from through his jersey. He spurted up. I knew that he was shot and slipped across towards him and, and, and heard the words Jesus, Mary and Joseph from my lips and I decided to rush for my life and try and get out. <laughs>